Uh, my name is Dustin Glecko. Um, I'm a member of the Independent Test Capability Team, uh, which is part of NASA IV and V program. Um, today I'm going to present what we refer to as NOS, or NASA Operational Simulator. Um, as a brief agenda, uh, I'm going to discuss the uh, Independent Test Capability Team, uh, just give an overview of, of what we do, who we are, um, a little overview of our facilities. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what, uh, NOS, the NASA Operational Simulator, uh, the architecture and the middleware we've developed um, to provide reusable components for testing flight software. Uh, and then I'll briefly go over uh, some utilization, what, what missions are currently using NOS. Uh, the ITC team, the, uh, our charter is to acquire, develop, and manage adaptable test environments uh, that enable the dynamic analysis of software behaviors for multiple NASA missions. Uh, that's sort of a mouthful. Uh, the key word is uh, dynamic analysis. Historically, uh, the IBNB program concentrated more on static analysis. Um, our team was uh, sort of created to uh, provide and manage test environments that allow them to do more dynamic analysis of flight software. Um, as you can see, uh, acquire, develop, um, so we, we're concentrating on system level simulations um, uh, for the complete mission. We use, as you'll see later on, an operational ground system, um, uh, similar to the uh, FPGA test environment talk. Um, we're, we're trying to solve a similar problem. Uh, we took the approach of we're using a software-only simulator using emulation, virtual machines. Um, but, but the key is we want to uh, have a test environment where we can run uh, delivered flight software binaries without recompilation um, running in a test environment. Um, uh, a lot of times we, um, you know, we have to do a survey, we acquire tools, uh, existing simulators, science instrument simulators uh, to pull in our environment, or sometimes we have to de develop our own uh, hardware models. There's a lot of custom hardware, FPGAs. So we model those to run in our uh, virtual computing platform. <laughs> um, as I said, the ITC team develops system simulators. Um, our area of expertise is hardware modeling uh, to run in our virtual computing platform. Uh, distributed simulation, we have many components. Um, we have science instrument simulators, uh, 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 dynamic simulators, uh, the ground system. These are all sort of tied together in a single system simulation test environment. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, software integration involved, um, time synchronization. Uh, the NOS architect architecture provides this capability. Uh, we have a pool of reusable hardware models that we can uh, hopefully reuse and carry across missions, um, and a custom developed middleware um, that sort of ties all the simulation components together. Um, my colleague uh, Justin McCarty spoke on Tuesday about our system test automation that sort of uh, allows us to, with this, this complex test environment of all these different uh, components, may, perhaps running in different virtual machines, uh, different OSs, to start and stop things and allow test automation. Uh, typical users of, of NOS uh, are VNV engineers, project developers, operators, and testers. Um, we're sort of expanding our, our user base. Uh, a little bit about our uh, laboratory, um, the John McBride Software Testing and Research, or JSTAR Lab. Uh, we have a cloud-based infrastructure <coughs> um, using server and desk desktop virtualization. Um, we have the option of deploying our simulators on the cloud. Um, so we work with numerous centers uh, at different locations. So it can be accessed via you know, a web browser. Um, or we can deploy to laptops. Um, we've actually deployed, as I'll show later, on, on a USB stick. As I said, these are software-only simulators. Um, you can actually run the flight software binaries on, on your laptop. Um, we do have some hardware in the lab. We have some RAD 750s, some FPGAs, um, some DSpace hardware. So uh, we do have capability for hardware in the loop uh, testing. Uh, but th this is mainly focused on uh, the software-only test environments that we, we provide. Um, we also have um, tools uh, um, for the IBNV analysts, uh, COTS, or any sort of uh, tools that, that we find uh, that we survey and, and bring in-house to support VNV activities. Uh, this, this image just sort of depicts our, our virtualized deployment. So um, if you were to use one of our simulators, you open your browser, and this sort of, uh, sort of shows, this is one of the missions we've supported. <laughs> so there are four different VMs, um, e each serving a different purpose, um, different OSs. 
uh, a lot of times, um, you know, certain simulators or, or certain pieces of uh, equipment that we need are developed for a certain lab for a certain test string, um, uh, designed to run on a, a specific OS. So we can do a disk dump and, and sort of virtualize that and, and run it on our lab. So we're effectively recreating the entire test environment. Um, so this shows, as I'll talk about Ghost and one of the simulators we, we've developed for GPM. Um, we have the assist ground station, uh, the dynamic simulator, um, the Windows VM is actually running the, the emulator to run the unmodified flight software binaries. And there's an additional uh, VM that it, it just uh, offers a build environment uh, if we needed to rebuild things. Um, the two images just show when we deploy our simulators on the cloud. Uh, so uh, everything's configuration managed. We have gold copies that um, you know we store, and as, as people are interested in using, uh, uh, we can sort of clone that and, and create separate isolated instances of, of these simulators. Uh, so each of them are um, isolated uh, via virtual network. Um, so there are two instances of this simulator running right now. So we can uh, deploy at large scale, uh, support multiple users. Uh, so that was a little bit about the independent uh, test capability team. And now I'm just going to um, give a brief overview of, of NAS. Uh, what is the NASA operational simulator? Um, as I mentioned, is a software-only simulation architecture. Um, as you can see in the um, large blue box, uh, that is our virtual computing platform. Um, that's what runs our processor and hardware models, uh, basically an instruction set simulator um, where we can sort of plug and play, uh, if you will, the unmodified flight software binaries. Um, uh, we, in, in the black, you see our NOS middleware. Um, that's the custom... Uh, layered architecture middleware that, that we've developed. Uh, it supports monitoring the bus, uh, dynamic interception capability. So any traffic that goes out over the bus, uh, we're able to intercept, um, which provides capability that uh, uh, BNB or testers are interested in, uh, fault injection, um, or, or just monitoring uh, messages going across the system. So the NOS middleware is sort of the, uh, the glue that ties together all these simulation components. Um, the NOS uh, simulator also uh, includes just software utilities, as I'll discuss later. Uh, these are all reusable modules uh, for the most part. I mean, projects have custom hardware, and we have to model that, um, custom FPGAs. So that virtual computing platform uh, emulates an entire um, CNDA track, a compact PCI um, chassis with, with all the necessary cards. Um, Again, the, the feature set, we have plug and play hardware models. <laughs> uh, some of them are acquired, some of them are, are developed in house for the custom hardware. Um, uh, one key, we use the operational ground system permission. So we have a virtual machine that, um, from the front end, from a user perspective, um, if you're familiar with the ground system, uh, that's the interface uh, that you get. You can run the test scripts that were delivered, that, that the project delivers um, to test the flight software. So it's not anything new that you have to learn to use. If you're familiar with the ground system, you, you can operate these simulators. Uh, we provide extensive APIs um, for our middleware in our test environment to um, allow extension to sort of, if there's a specific thing that you need to test, uh, we provide that capability. Um, bus monitoring, as I said, we, we can sort of monitor any, any message passed through the middleware. And deployment and maintenance. <laughs> Um, we have the cloud-based uh, deployment, but as I said, we've also deployed um, um, any laptop you can run these on. You don't need specific hardware. Um, obviously, a decent laptop um, helps out in simulation time. Uh, we've deployed one of our missions on, on a USB stick, so it's, it's pretty neat. You can you know, plug a USB, um, start some virtual machines, and you're up and running with the flight software. Um, so that was a little bit about, about the architecture. Um, uh, now I'm going to uh, briefly overview uh, the NOS middleware. Uh, so it offers a reusable communication mechanism. Um, it provides synchronization between the distributed applications. Um, like I said, we're, we're acquiring simulators. Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If simulators exist for science instruments, uh, we sort of do a survey. We bring those in-house. Um, sometimes it's, um, you know, it sounds easy, but it's, it's complex. Uh, a lot of these simulators are tied to specific pieces of hardware. Um, they're not intended to just be run as software, so we have to sort of find that line, um, separate out the hardware calls, um, replace those with calls into our middleware. 
uh, and, and make sure everything's synced in time with the virtual computing platform. Um, this was designed to be flexible and extensible. Um, if there are new communication protocols that you want to build on top of our bus, um, it's, it's easy to do. We provide the APIs to that. Some of the features, uh, this is transport agnostic. Uh, we're using cross-platform C++. We have robust user APIs. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a layered architecture. Um, included uh, what we've used for missions we've worked on. We already have a, a 1553 space wire, um, just some discrete signals, and time sync built on top of the middleware. Um, so with a software-only architecture, um, like I said, sometimes things are tied to specific hardware. If you're tied to 1553 card, we, need, we cut out those hardware cards, and we call our fi virtual 1553 bus, which is a software-only bus. And of course, interception, um, um, which uh, VNV uh, uses that extensively for analysis. It um, doesn't require modification of the software under test, but it allows you to um, capture messages, intercept, uh, say, 1553 traffic uh, for fault injection, sort of flip bits. Um, uh, this just uh, diagram dis depicts uh, what I've just discussed. You have the IO layer on top of that, the base layer with interception capability built in. So as protocols are added, um, um, we still have interception capability because it's built into the um, bottom layer. Um, so those are the layers we, we have existing, the 1553 space wire and discrete. So the system under test, um, um, which it can use these layers. Uh, if you have um, a flight software that uses uh, in your CNDH, you have 1553 or space wire, that capability exists. Uh, this diagram just, just uh, simplifies, um, illustrates um, our, our NOS middleware. Um, if you have communication going from node A to node B in a normal, normal data flow, uh, using our APIs, you can easily register a middleware. So all traffic passes uh, <laughs> that you register for passes through your interceptor uh, before going from node A to node B, which, of course, allows you to modify the data. Um, you're free to do what you want with the data. You can use it just to monitor the traffic. Um, you can flip bits, uh, inject errors. And uh, another useful um, <coughs> um, that's to the VNB analysts are actually blocking data. So what happens if node B doesn't receive that traffic, that 1553 message? So like I said, this, this is all built into the NOS middleware. Um, this just depicts some of the UIs that um, uh, VNB's used. Um, built on top of the interception. Uh, this shows the 1553 UI. Uh, I'm not going to go into much detail. Um, it's just a graphical, a nice graphical representation where you can sort of you know, click different RTs or uh, to block traffic from going to a node and um, sort of analyze your system. Uh, this is our space wire interface that we have. So that shows our network topology, um, a graphical depiction. Like I said, this is a software-only space wire bus. Um, so this gives a nice graphical output of, of your routers, your endpoints. Um, and, and again, you can block data flow um, from reaching your endpoints. Uh, so NOS, uh, as I said, it, it includes, it, it's a system, a, a pool of assets where we have reusable hardware models, um, the middleware, which ties everything together. And we also have uh, various software utilities to, to aid in uh, testing. Uh, one, a virtual oscilloscope. Uh, we have insight, we, we have uh, UIs where we can view the entire memory. Um, we can look at registers, uh, bits at the device level. Um, you can actually pause the simulation. Um, you can also look at board level signals, uh, whether interrupts are raised and lowered, uh, watchdog timers. You can sort of monitor that, um, pause, look at the states of registers. You can also swap values in, in registers, uh, inject errors that way. Uh, we have a virtual uh, 1553 bus, as I mentioned. Um, so using our APIs, you can create software RTs or BCs. Uh, if you create a BC, it's, it's a simple XML file that, that you can define your schedules, uh, and they will execute. Um, uh, monitoring uh, capability, uh, we have a log or two, um, just a, a text base. Uh, we're using, using the interception, um, we're basically printing out. You can look at all the message traffic, very useful for debugging. And we have a PASS 3200 software emulator. Um, we also have a virtual space wire router. Um, so it, it's also configured via XML. Um, you define your logical and, and path addresses. Um, so basically, you, you have your entire network topology defined in XML. 
Um, and that's how the NOS middleware knows where, where to route the traffic. So that briefly explains um, the ITC team, what, what we're trying to achieve. Um, so who's using this technology? Uh, the initial program, the Global Precipitation Measurement, or GPM uh, mission, uh, that was the first mission um, that sort of uh, we wanted to prototype and, and see if this was feasible, this concept. Uh, we created a simulator, GoSim, the GPM operational simulator, which is a closed loop uh, simulator, including the operational ground system, uh, unmodified, unmodified flight software, environmental simulator, and science instrument simulators. Uh, we sort of integrated all this together, developed our custom hardware models, and uh, proved that the, this was a useful um, testing tool. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope, that's currently our flagship, um, uh, we have a simulator, we call it GIST, the James Webb Integrated Simulation and Test, where the goal of this was to show we can sort of extend this. James Webb's a lot, a lot larger of a project, um, it's a lot more ambitious. Uh, we're reusing a lot of the components that were developed from GOSIM. Um, and we're currently developing that. The nice thing about these simulators, we can, being software only, we can stub out behavior we don't, uh, we, uh, that we're not interested in at the time. Um, our designs driven by our users, um, typically uh, V and V, um, they know what they want to test at certain points and we can cater the simulator to get something out there um, as quick as possible. If they're in only interested in, in James Webb's instance as, uh, initially they were interested in testing the spacecraft flight software side as opposed to the science instrument flight software. I'm not sh sure uh, if you're familiar with, with James Webb. Um, so we could stub out the entire ISIM side. We didn't need any of that, and we could just deploy our simulator, allowing them to run the spacecraft flight software, uh, do their testing as we incrementally uh, develop and release. <coughs> um, the GoSim simulator, uh, this just lists, lists the components uh, to sort of reiterate. Uh, there are many components we had to integrate together. Uh, COT simulator, uh, the instrument simulators, uh, the ground system, the Goddard dynamic simulator, uh, using our NOS middleware to tie everything together, and we have our hardware, hardware models uh, sort of running in this virtual computing platform. Um, so what capabilities did this provide to the engineers? Um, again, key, loading and running the unmodified flight software binaries. Um, executing test flight scripts. A lot of times, you know, we're delivered. We're running the actual flight uh, test scripts that are used by delivered by the project uh, using the ground system. Um, we have single step debugging. Uh, whether you want to attach Workbench to your flight software, um, and we have the ability to inject errors via the, either the ground system if it provides that capability, or at a more detailed level, uh, if you want to do some uh, sort of some more exotic things, you can use our middleware register and and. Uh, you're free to do what you want with the, with the traffic. Um, given that software only sort of running on our servers, um, we can stress test the system. Um, we can run it uh, for days using some of the uh, delivered uh, stress test uh, scripts. And uh, just to note, um, um, this, this simulator was well, well received. Um, it received honorable mention at the 2012 uh, NASA Software of the Year. Um, we delivered it and, and our users were, were pretty happy. Um, there were limitations, but um, I think the key, um, a, as was mentioned, a lot of times the test strings, uh, the hardware's not available. Um, this sort of bridges a gap. You have to understand the limitations of this software-only simulation. But uh, given that it's software-only, you can run it on a laptop. It puts a testing tool in the hands of uh, users, developers, um, at an early stage. Um, our GIST simulation sort of uh, emphasizes the same points. Uh, it is a software-only spacecraft simulator uh, using uh, operational ground system, which is a different ground system than, than GOSIM. Um, we had to develop a lot of uh, custom hardware models for the um, ISIM or the, the science side of, of James Webb. Um, due to the complexity of James Webb, um, some of our test scripts, um, as, as Justin presented, uh, we have an automated testing framework. Uh, the test scripts that are delivered by the project uh, that are executed through the operational uh, ground system, we sort of leverage that. Uh, those scripts are used by VNV to test the flight software. We also use those scripts and try to leverage those to test our um, software-only simulation environment to make sure it's, it's operating as expected. 
um, along with, with unit tests. And we've actually leveraged some of the uh, hardware diagnostic tools used to check out the, uh, the hardware. Um, um, you know, a lot of times we're reading through specs, ICDs, and trying to model this hardware as accurately as possible. Uh, so that just provides a tool to sort of verify our testing environment. Um, so some users of, of our simulators um, for GoSim, uh, flight software testers, uh, software safety, VNV engineers have, have used our simulators. Um, uh, similar for just the uh, um, James Webb development team, VNV engineers. Uh, uh, currently, uh, operations, uh, are, they're looking at our system, um, our simulators for sort of training and uh, running through some of their tests. Um, another key point um, under the GOSIM um, uh, bullet one, uh, the key is uh, reduces the required use of lab resources. Um, a lot of times there, uh, there's a limit to uh, when you can access hardware, when you can use it. Um, uh, this, this technology you know, provides you with a tool that, that you can easily run and use. Um, obviously, it doesn't replace needing the hardware. Um, you have to understand uh, the limitations, the level of fidelity we're providing, but it's a useful tool. Uh, you can use the ground station, send commands, view telemetry. From, a, from the flight software's perspective, it's running in hardware. Um, there's no recompilation. Um, as long as memories map correctly, you know, we stub out things. Um, so uh, in closing, uh, NOS provides uh, generic software-only simulation architecture uh, that is actually in use. It's been utilized on numerous NASA missions. Uh, we sort of have a, a pool of reusable hardware models. Uh, the more missions we work on, the more we model, the, the more uh, can be reused across missions. Uh, we have a custom-developed middleware with user APIs uh, that provides interception capability uh, for testing. Um, the NOS architecture is transparent to users. If you're just interested in using the ground station and interacting with flight software, uh, sending commands, viewing telemetry, um, from your perspective, you're just you're, you start a VM and you're viewing the the grounds uh, the ground system. Uh, that's all transparent to you. Uh, NOS also extends to other domains. Um, so that's it. This is some contact information uh, URL. Our, our government co government contact is Justin Morris. Um, we're always interested in new users. Um, if you're interested, please uh, contact us. Um, there are also some, some videos sort of demonstrating this. There's a, there's a nice video on GOS, of GoSim on YouTube if you're interested. Um, so that, that summarizes everything. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? OK. Oh. Um, Okay, so uh, I just want to understand the intent of this. Are you uh, using this for VNV or just really risk reduction? I mean, are you doing acceptance through it? Uh, no, VNV, um, a little bit of both. Uh, VNV, I, they identify high risk areas, and they sort of, in the initially with this, uh, identify high risk areas that they want to test. So that's where we concentrate our efforts um, to sort of model the maybe it's specific pieces of hardware we need. Um, this is not for acceptance, but it's just a testing tool. But can you do, uh, you, it seems like you would be able to do destructive or semi-destructive testing, um, you know, that sort of shooting holes through memory and seeing how the fault management uh, routines pick up on that. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I think that a, as a user you would have to understand, like as I said, the limitations. Um, you know, we're modeling with a certain level of fidelity. Um, obviously, uh, in James Webb's case, uh, there's a lot of space wire science data, you know, going through the pipeline. Um, we're not modeling, at, at, obviously, at the bit level, um, so you wouldn't be able to see sort of throughput bottlenecks in, in, in hardware, any, anything like that. If we would model with that fidelity, then, um, you know, the, the simulation time per real second exponen exponentially increases. Um, but for high-level sort of system operations, um, it, it provides a, a decent level of fidelity. All, all the hardware, um, sort of, and the back end on the on the FPGAs and everything, uh, those are modeled, um, you know, fairly accurate um, based on the spec. 
but perhaps not the uh, signal level. Like we're not at the bus level saying you know, this much data pass uh, pass through, and then like arbiters uh, sort of going back and forth. We're just sending everything as BOF transactions. So there are things that can't be tested, but but certainly um, as far as errors and how flight software handles that, we do mo we do model uh, timing um, to a certain extent. I mean, if, if you know the specs show that it takes so long for memory write, we put that in our in our simulators. Uh, you said something uh, just at the very end about using it for testing uh, software early on w when there's no other established test bed. So uh, does that mean that you have a stub and dummy capability to supply functionality that for, for the missing software components? I, I, uh, I, I'm assuming it sounded like you did, and I was just wanted to make sure. Um, you're speaking about the software side? Uh, the yeah, well, in the software so when, side? when software's being developed and, and, and one component is is ready before all the other ones with which it would interface. If you could take that component and put it in your environment and stub and dummy out the ones that are missing. Uh, so yes, um, from our perspective, flight software is a black box. Um, realistically, it's it's never that simple. But ideally, um, you know, we model the hardware. We provide an environment. Um, no matter what what's available on the actual flight software, what what apps are there, we run it. I mean, if it, if it'll run, it'll run in our environment. Um, as I said, like we go through an iterative process uh, right now for GIST, our James Webb simulator. Um, we went through numerous iterations where we didn't even have the, the science instrument, the ISIM side, uh, modeled. Um, so we didn't have any data. Uh, it was you know, for uh, failover testing for VNV. &V. Um, they wanted to test the uh, uh, failover capabilities of, of the uh, um, spacecraft flight software side. So everything else was stubbed out. Um, just the spacecraft flight software was, was run. I, I may have missed it, but how do you um, ensure that the timing is accurate in the, in, in so the software model? Our, our middleware provides a, um, a time sync um, layer. So we're pulling in a lot of simulators from a, from a lot of different areas. Um, uh, many times they were never meant to be sort of separated from hardware or so sometimes we have to hack at code <laughs> per se. Um, so we have to Ideally, we would get the source, or you would provide an API to allow us to sort of drive the clock. And everything's driven from our processor models, um, from the processor clock time. So everything's in, in, in lock and step that way. Just to kind of tag on to um, what the fellow down here, two rows below, was talking about, I think that you're talking about like mixing and matching software simulation with hardware, <laughs> with real hardware, is that what you're, okay. Yeah, um, just as a note, and FSW11, I gave a presentation on, called using POSIX IO for mix and match. Um, you might want to take a look at that and send me an email if you have any questions about that in general. It's based on a lot of the CFE stuff as well that we used on Laddie. Yep. So to, to, I guess, expand on that, too, um, with our emulated environment, uh, real time, and, and if it's running on a laptop, like your processor time, you know, it's continuing as normal. But from flight software's perspective, it's running in that environment, and that's the time it's using, which is, you know, sometimes 50% real time. So you don't sort of have, have gaps of, you know, so much real time passes where flight software flight software sees the emulated environment time. So from its perspective, you know, time's traversing slowly, um, but it's all all in lock and step. Other questions? Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you.